All right. Um, welcome everyone to um, the um, Zero Textbook Cost Degree uh, webinar. Um, um, during Open Education Week. Uh, this is Una Daly from the Open Education Consortium. And I'm very happy to have three experts here with me today um, to tell you about the Zero Textbook Cost Degree Initiative uh, that, is, um, that is spreading throughout um, our colleges and universities. Before we um, get into the details, I just wanted to go over a few technical um, logistics with you. Um, we are using Blackboard Collaborate this morning and we thank the California Community College System for providing us with this access. Um, if you are new to Blackboard, uh, you will see um, a window on the left side of your screen which has uh, participants in it. Uh, and if you scroll down, you should see yourself in there. Uh, directly underneath, you should see a chat window and um, you can uh, make comments and ask questions as we go along. Um, in that chat window. Um, at the end of the webinar, we will have time for um, Q&A and you can get on the microphone as well. And uh, once again, I want to welcome everyone to Open Education Week. It's um, going on all week. Um, and um, it's a global celebration to raise awareness about free and open educational opportunities that exist for everyone throughout the world. Um, and of course, open education is um, something that is beyond formal education as well. It really um, applies to people who are trying to develop new skills for their jobs um, uh, and for personal learning as well. This morning, of course, our focus will be more on formal studies and, and the expansion of teaching resources. Uh, but if you haven't been to the Open Education Week site, um, please do uh, go there and see what all the activities are this week. And it's simply OpenEducationWeek.org. Now we want to ask you uh, where you're from, and um, if you uh, if you can, you can pick up an icon uh, from the toolbar that's in the middle of your screen. If you go to where there's a little star, you can pick up one of those um, icons and then drop it um, on the globe to show us um, where you're located. It's always interesting to. Uh, was <laughs> Looks like we have somebody in the Pacific Ocean there, or perhaps that's Hawaii. Um, um, yesterday on um, our webinar, we had folks from Europe uh, who were joining us, and we're, I'm broadcasting from uh, California in North America. Okay, uh, looks like we've got uh, great. We've got folks from um, all around North America. All right, very exciting. Thanks for sharing that. And um, you, if you can't get the toolbar to work, um, please do introduce yourself in the chat window. Uh, and let us know what institution you're with and any interest you have in OER. Now I want to give you a chance to meet our speakers this morning. Um, and uh, once again, do introduce yourself in the chat window as well. Uh, first off, I'm, I would like to give uh, TJ Bliss, um, he's the Education Officer at the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, a chance to say hello to everyone. TJ? Hello everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you and look forward to chatting a bit about some really exciting things going on in the world of higher education, specifically community colleges, um, around open educational resources and um, increasing college access and success. Um, through some really exciting uh, ideas and models that Kim and Linda will actually talk about in detail. Great. Thanks, TJ. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Kim. Uh, she's a counselor and instructor at Nova Community College and has been very active in the zero degree program at um, Northern Virginia Hello, College. everyone. I'm excited to talk about what we've been doing with the OER initiative at NOVA, specifically our Extended Learning Institute, and to share some specific examples of what I've been working on with our SDV 100 College Success Skills course. Thank you, Kim. And finally, um, I want to introduce Linda Williams, who is a business faculty at Tidewater Community College. Um, and has really been the lead on their Z degree business uh, um, degree. Linda. Hi. Um, good afternoon. And I appreciate you all giving me the opportunity to share 
the experience uh, that Tidewater has had over the past two years as we have migrated an entire Associate of Science degree from publisher textbooks to open educational resources. Great. Thanks so much, Linda. Now, um, I just want to give you a brief overview um, of open ed, um, very brief, uh, for those who might be new to this area uh, before we get directly into our presentations. So the Open Education Consortium, which um, I, I am on staff with, um, was uh, there really at the beginning of open educational resources uh, and the, the current movement. So this started back at MIT and then uh, very quickly became a worldwide consortium. Uh, we now represent um, 280 organizations in 40 countries around the world. Um, and over 30,000 courses um, have been put online for free and um, have been translated into 29 languages. So this is not limited to North America by any means. Um, the Community College Consortium that I work directly with um, has a very similar mission. We're an associate consortium of the Open Ed Consortium and work very closely there. Um, and it's all about expanding access to high quality materials, supporting faculty in choice and development of materials, and of course our, our, our major motivation is improving student success um, in their educational goals. And um, the Community College Consortium represents over 250 uh, community and technical colleges in 19 states and provinces. So very basic definitions here. Um, UNESCO and the Hewlett Foundation have a very similar definition of open educational resources. Those two um, organizations um, have been um, the primary uh, um, initial movers and shakers in OER and have been supporting this movement for over 10 years. So they are teaching, learning, or research materials that are in the public domain or have been released under an intellectual property license that allows their free use, adaption, and distribution. And primarily today that intellectual property license is the Creative Commons license. But what, what that means is um, often people, when they're first getting started with this, they get confused between the difference between open and free. So free may not mean that you can reuse it. You may be able to access something but an open license actually gives you as a faculty member and also as students a great deal more um, permissions to share materials. And uh, the Lumen Learning Organization uh, breaks this down into the five R's. Um, that's retaining the content, reusing it, revising it, remixing, and redistributing. Re, sorry, redistrib redistribution of open content. So, um, this open license sits on top of copyright and makes sharing easier. It doesn't get rid of the copyright, but it allows the copyright holder to share easily with others. And um, the zero textbook cost degree program is all about taking these open educational resources, um, institutions, uh, primarily faculty, of course, as the content experts, um, but working often with librarians and instructional designers are finding high quality materials, adapting them, and using them to replace expensive textbooks. Um, there has been a number of um, very interesting case studies, uh, pilot programs that have um, have happened over the last two years. We're going to hear from Tidewater College and NOVA who are, uh, who are several of the leaders in this area. What they have seen, of course, is that there's a huge savings for students. Um, usually, uh, in particular, those are two-year colleges, so students um, who are able to participate in the zero textbook cost degrees are eliminating two years' worth of um, textbook costs, which uh, generally runs into several thousand dollars. Um, it's giving faculty more choices around the materials they bring into the classroom. And early research is showing that um, it's having a positive impact on student retention and student learning. And uh, so now we are going to hear from um, several people who have um, actually led these efforts and uh, they're going to tell you in more detail what's going on. 
And our first speaker this morning is, is Kim, uh, Kim Burkle, who is a counselor and instructor at the Extended Learning Institute at Northern Virginia Community College. Hello again, Kim. everybody. I, um, I'm going to talk to you about NOVA's OER program. Um, NOVA is the largest institution in Virginia and one of 23 colleges making up the Virginia Community College system. We launched our OER program in 2013 and continue to grow and improve on our OER course offerings. Dr. Preston Davis he created and leads the OER initiative at NOVA. The program is a real team effort with librarians, instructional designers, and faculty leaders all working together to create high quality and sustainable OER courses for NOVA students. These courses increase student access and are more affordable with fee without fees for textbook textbooks and have led to increase student success and retention. Right now, students can earn the Associate of Science and Social Sciences using all OER-based courses. So far, also, over 5,000 5, NOVA students have saved over $800,000 in textbook costs since fall 2013. So you can see it's quite a cost savings for our students. The Eli Librarian was the first to start gathering OER resources for instructor use in developing OER courses. The NOVA Library webpage now provides a wealth of resources for use across all the NOVA campuses. So from this screenshot here, you can see just an example of what was developed uh, through the NOVA library webpage, the repositories, access to open textbooks, open courseware, uh, ebooks, journals, videos, um, information about OER at NOVA, and then a little screenshot in the bottom right hand corner just shows how these resources are used uh, in the, or can be used in an OER course. These are the variety of resources that I use in our SDV 100 College Success Skills course. I wanted to use a consistent textbook and was able to find a wonderful textbook through sailor.org, which is one of the uh, free textbook repositories. I also utilize a lot of websites uh, such as Student Lingo, YouTube, TED, Films on Demand. We also utilize a variety of websites through NOVA. Uh, we have college resources, career exploration. As SDV is a college success skills course, students do a lot of self-assessment. And I was able to find a wealth of assessments available for students to use, such as Smarter Measure, our Virginia Education Wizard, BARC, Humanetrics, Wikidot, MindTools, and the product um, everfi.com, which covers financial literacy. We also offer free in-house webinars that our counselors, me and uh, some of the other counselors, offer for our students and we utilize them in the course as well. So for example, we use our Exploring Career Options and Getting Ready for Your Next Semester. So all of these resources are free for the student to access. So here's a screenshot of the example of one of the topics in the course. This is the learning styles topic. And you can see by the screenshot the number of free resources that we utilize just for this topic at, alone. Studi students utilize the College Success eBook. They watch a short video from YouTube on multiple intelligences. They also access our career services website to take some uh, personality and learning style assessments, such as the Young Typology and the VARC. And they do this so that they can complete the What's Your Style assignment and then post in the blog. I was excited to take part in the OER initiative, having served as the lead to redesign the campus base SDV 100 to become hybrid. As part of this redesign process, I formed a SDV redesign team, and together we met with several publishers in order to select a common textbook for the course. The team agreed that the cost of the textbook was high for a one credit course. Um, it was $50, was the cheapest that we could get the book down to, for, and that was for a new book. 
um, if we wanted to resell the book and uh, have it be a used textbook, it was thirty-seven fifty. So we were also discouraged at how the publishers seem to push the newest editions. Um, we piloted a version of the hybrid course um, using a publisher's text book and online resource, and we weren't even through the first year of using the book, and the publishers were trying to get us to go with a newer edition. And the problem with that is if you go through the, to a newer edition, you can't use the books for resale from that first edition that we used. We are also at the mercy of the technology of the publisher and their updates to online resources, and that seemed to happen rather frequently. Um, again, within the first year of piloting the course, we were dealing with their updates in, to their online resources, and it didn't coincide with when our sessions began. So it became a logistical problem when we were piloting a common hybrid course across um, five campuses and the Eli division. So you know we were dealing with over 200 sections and. Um, it just, you know, we would be dealing with over 200 sections if we were using it across the whole college. So even when we started with a pilot section, we were running into problems right away. Um, so shortly after I was working with creating the hybrid course, um, the OER initiative came about at Eli, and I jumped at the chance because I felt like I could develop an OER online SDV 100 college success sales course that could be designed to allow more academic freedom, provide a rich experience for the student, engage students with a variety of resources and activities and assignments, as you could see from the example previous, and all those resources that I was able to find for this one credit course. And what I find is the best point is that it gives students immediate access to the course materials. If you're an instructor, um, you probably have your students at the beginning of your class telling you they don't have the textbook yet. Maybe their financial aid didn't come through. Maybe they haven't received their paycheck yet to go out and buy the book. Or the bookstore is out of the textbook and they can't get started. So students end up starting late. Um, they're catching up. They're missing assignments. They're missing deadlines. And that can affect their grades. So with OER, it gives immediate access to the course material. So students can get started on day one and they can get started with reading the book, they can get started with the learning activities, and so far it's been a great experience. I haven't had any students say, I haven't been able to start the course because I don't have access to my materials. It's all there in the course for them. So with the uh, online OER course, I took the lead and designed most of the course. I provided the instructor training on the new course, and I started small by piloting a handful of online sections in fall 2013. So the course was redesigned in summer 2013, and this is the online version. And I started small with the on online one um, in the fall of 2013. And then I planned to expand the pilot in spring 2014. But the instructors enjoyed the OER course so much, either with piloting or in the training, that they all wanted to go OER. So in spring 2014, the online SDV 100 course became all OER format, Open Educational Resource. And later that spring, we started working on the hybrid course and designed an OER template for that and started piloting that one in the summer of 2014, no, spring 2014, our second eight week sessions. And then we've been piloting in the summer, fall 2014, and the spring 2015, with the goal of this fall 2015, all SDV 100, both online and hybrid, will be OER courses across the college. And the reason this is an easier process for us is because our course is common. So through the online, we have a common template. And the hybrid, we have a common online template. And then for the campus, face-to-face uh, -face meetings, the uh, instructors can utilize the resources that we provide as options in the course. They can use resources that they found on their own and used with throughout the years. And it's interesting to see how many instructors actually have been using OER resources all along in their campus face-to-face -face base sections. Um, so it's exciting to provide that academic freedom to them where they can continue to use that and find more resources and contribute to a quality OER course. So when I ran the pilot, um, 
I wanted to get feedback from the students. I wanted to see, you know, what did they think about OER? Um, so I created a survey and piloted it first in the online OER, and you can see um, the feedback is extremely positive. Uh, students were all in the 90, 93, 100, 97% um, as far as feeling that they liked not having to buy a purchase, not having to purchase a textbook. They felt the College Success eBook was informative and addressed the topics well. The videos were informative and addressed the topics well. And they thought that the assignments and activities related well to the assigned readings and videos. So that it felt like, you know, the course was just a good packaged course. It was engaging. The resources were, were good. Uh, the assignments and activities matched the video and the resources. So it gave us confidence that we created a good online course. So when we piloted the hybrid, we've been asking for feedback from the students. And so far, the feedback has been very similar, very, very positive. Um, they like not having to buy, uh, buy the textbook. And because of the campus face-to-face -face version, students are more inclined to have, have something in their hands, a book in their hands. Um, but we find that a very small percent actually chose to print the ebook. And they can do that if they want. We provide a PDF and an RTF file so that students could do that or print sections of the book if they wanted to. But the same thing in the hybrid version, which is similar to our online version in content um, instructor, in structure, um, that they felt the book was informative, the videos are informative, um, the assignments and activities relate, the directions are clear and easy to follow, and the most positive is 93% would take more OER courses. And SCV 100 is a gateway course at NOVA. Students take it in their first 15 credits. So they're getting exposed to both an online format and OER. And so we're looking forward to having more of those students take the OER courses. And we're hoping that not just we don't just have the bulk of our courses that are OER online, but that across the college we start seeing more hybrid and face-to-face -face adopt the OER courses as well. Um, it's just a quick slide. I'm not going to read all of these quotes, but these are some of the quotes from the surveys uh, of how students feel about OER courses. Um, since my experience with OER courses has been great so far, I've been enrolled in four classes during summer in this modality, so we know that there are other courses and they're taking advantage of it. Um, the open educational resources provided was a great way of saving time and money. Everything was accessible and handy in use, which benefited me in many ways regarding my, my education in college. Um, some say I, you know, I like not having to carry the book around. Uh, but there's just such great feedback. And I see this over and over again, students saying that this was a good experience and they really enjoy the OER format. Some of the uh, concerns we had was that uh, teachers wanted to know, you know, how do we know if um, the OER course is a quality course? So um, through ELI, we use Quality Matters. It's a faculty-centered, nationally recognized peer review process that focuses on continuous quality improvement of online and hybrid course design. Um, ELI strive to use a standard of measurement to meet QM standards in the course design and revision process. Uh, so we started with the online OER SDV 100 course, submitted that for review in 2014. And this process focuses on quality course design that focuses on eight essential standards. So at least I know in the structure of the course and the design of the course, the SDV 100 course meets the standards. We received 97 out of 99 points, which lets me know, OK, as far as the way the course is designed with course overview and introduction, learning objectives, assessment and measurement, instructional materials, and so on, that that part is quality. And I serve as the subject matter expert during the review. So if the reviewers had any questions and maybe they weren't a subject matter expert in SDV, they could contact me. But it comes across that they didn't ask me any questions, that they felt the content was clear as well. So that was really positive. And in the future, I'd like to see the hybrid go through this review process if possible. And that's it for me. Um, if you want to get more information, you can either contact me regarding the SDV 100 course. If you have questions um, about our OER initiative at NOVA, you can contact um, Dr. Preston Davis. And here's his, uh, both of our contact information. Thank you.
Great. Uh, thank you so much, Kim, for sharing the OER-based associate degree um, with us this morning, um, and in particular the development of that college readiness course for students, which is part of that OER degree. Um, there's a couple of questions in the chat window, um, which um, I'll let um, uh, um, Kim answer if she can in the chat. Um, sure. Just because we have so many speakers, we'll come back to those at the end if we don't get a chance to answer them in the chat window. And um, now I would like to move to uh, hear from Linda Williams, uh, who is a professor of business management and administration at uh, Tidewater Community College, and she's been the faculty lead on the business administration Z degree. Linda, all right, <clears throat> thank you. Um, so what Tidewater did was in the fall of 2013 we launched our Associate of Science in Business Administration as an entire degree that a student could start and finish and expend zero dollars on textbooks. Um, we put together a team, faculty team of 13 faculty members um, across all disciplines because our AS in Business Admin covers accounting and history and English and SDV and stats and PE and all of those courses were built out um, using open educational resources. And I focus on the word built out because we did not adopt as heavily as we should have um, and part of that was a, a function of the content that was available then versus what's available now. Um, moving forward, our mantra is adopt and adapt and only build if you have to. Um, and we are coming to the end of our um, second uh, year as pilot. So we run two fall, we're in our last spring semester, um, had about 2,500 students come through. So ultimately our motivation was in a lot of ways this graph. Um, the idea that textbook costs have grown at a rate, you know, two and a half times that of um, the rate of um, the consumer price index and inflation. And what we knew was every semester we had students who couldn't afford textbooks, who dropped classes because they didn't have course materials or did not succeed because they fell behind. And although they hope to get caught up, we just know that they don't. Um, so a lot of our motivation was to address this high cost textbook uh, industry. Um, the other thing that we looked at was this concept of, and this frightening fact that in the fourth quarter of 2000, first quarter of 2014, student loan debt surpassed credit card debt in the United States. Um, the United States has approximately $661 billion in credit card debt. However, student loan debt is now $1.1 trillion. So this incredible burden of financial aid debt, um, student loan debt after students leave school, coupled with the access issues of textbook and college affordability were really our motivating factors. Um, and they were motivated and spurred on by um, Dr. DeMart, our Chief Academic Officer, um, who was inspired by David Wiley of um, Lumen Learning and the 5R fame um, to see if Tidewater could build an entire degree um, based solely on open educational resources. So that was our motivation. And what we realized is that once we removed the textbook costs for our students, we had reduced the cost of their Associate of Science and Business Admin degree by 25%. Um, we using, we're using the figure um, from the College Board Association in terms of what the textbook costs are um, in order to, to estimate these savings. But We've literally shaved 25% off of the cost of um, a 
and it's an AS in business administration for a student um, at uh, at Tidewater, and for especially for a community college student. I mean, that is that's just I can't even tell you how huge it is talking to my students who are enrolled in these classes. I mean, for some of them, it really is life changing. So we've run the um, the pilot now for four semesters. And this is what we're looking at in terms of enrollment. Um, we estimate that we will have 892 completers this spring semester, um, put about 2,500 students through. We've run 115 sections. And we estimate that we've saved them about a quarter of a million dollars in textbook costs. Um, and that's a quarter of a million dollars that either doesn't get transferred into <clears throat> student loan debt um, or it gets transferred into things like gas money and food and daycare um, for our students. So um, it's hard to, to see any way that saving students a quarter of a million dollars in four semesters uh, isn't good for, for the student and the economy. So what I wanted to really focus on was a little bit of how we went about creating the courses and then some of the outcomes that we've seen. So working with Lumen Learning, Kim Thanos and David Wiley, we made a decision to take and rebuild our courses. We stripped them down to the course learning outcomes, and then from there built to the module level objectives and leveraged the power of properly licensed OER content in order to directly support and align our content with the course learning outcomes. So this is an example of something that I did. I teach the business stats class where I literally took a broad course level objective, looked at this module level objective of identifying the, the types of data, and then went to, in this case, an OpenStax introductory to statistics book, um, CC by license, so just attribution. And I said, all I need is section 1-4. I don't need this massive quantity of broadly written, you know, overly verbose content in order to teach my student this module level objectives so that they can successfully achieve the course objectives and move on to, to the next adventure in, uh, in business staff. And so this was really the iterative model that we used, um, this idea of course rebuild and redesign. Um, very closely associated and, and mirrors what Kim was talking about in terms of quality matters, this idea of aligning content with, um, with objectives in a way that leads the student to success. Um, after the courses were rebuilt and launched, um, we began to collect data um, from the very beginning. And one of the pieces that we've looked at is enrollment figures. Um, we know that the students, based on the surveys that we have taken um, from them the, these four semesters. Um, that students, 97% of them would enroll in a Z course if it fit into their schedule. So what we're seeing is that students kind of vote with their feet. Um, we've got you know about 80 some, about 82% of capacity um, compared to about 64% capacity in terms of um, enrollment um, seats to students. So we knew that they were signing up, and so then the question became, what happens when they get there? Well, we have, and I think most community colleges have a drop date. And that drop date is that point at the beginning of the semester at which a student can drop the course for a tuition refund. And so we began to compare. Z courses against their non-Z counterparts across the college. And we found that we were retaining significantly more of our students than our non-Z counterparts. If we think about a drop rate, we dropped about 1.25% of 
um, fewer students than our non Z counterparts. And that may not seem like a lot um, of a drop when you say, well, gosh, it's less than 1.5%. But if we look at nationwide having about 5.5 million students enrolled in community colleges, what we're looking at is saving about 68,000 students from dropping after in the first two weeks of class. So we're encouraged, and the numbers have, are holding pretty steady as we move through the pilot. So then we said, well, where's the next point where we lose students? Um, we lose them at the withdrawal date. The withdrawal date is that point in the semester where a student can withdraw from the class and receive a grade of W, and we call it the no academic penalty withdrawal. And we know that once the students get to that withdrawal date, that we are retaining about 2.21% more of our students. We have less than 4.5% of our students who then later withdraw from, withdraw from classes. Again, when you look at this over the, the life cycle of a student's path through college, um, we are retaining more of our students and hopefully um, helping them on that path to completion and to obtain that credential. Um, so when we looked at, you know, drop and withdrawal, we said, okay, well, that's great. Um, they're not dropping. They're not withdrawing. So how are they doing in the course? We define success as a student who completes a course with a grade of C or better. And where we have made the most strides is in student success. As the faculty lead looking at all of the courses and as an instructor teaching Z courses, I believe that one of the factors in student success is because students have access to 100% of their content on day one, they don't fall behind and they don't get left behind. I think that because they get to start all from the same common ground, um, that the careful selection and alignment of OER content to learning objectives allows the student to be more successful. So when we started the project, our goal was to increase student success increase e instructor effectiveness while at the same time removing textbook costs. And we never said that OER was going to be better. We said we just need to be as good or better. And what we're finding in terms of student success is in many cases we are much better. These are just some numbers pulled from three of the Z courses. The first one are the student success rates for Math 163, which is a pre-calculus course. And what we saw was in the non-Z sections, college-wide, about 62% of the students were finishing the course with a grade of C or better. We found that after three semesters in the Z courses, about 94% of the students were completing with a grade of C or better. Um, and this is a course that was completely stripped down and, and rebuilt from scratch. It's a beautiful course and utilizes MyOpenMath as the platform to assist students with algorithmic um, homework and testing and assessment. Um, the next course is a Business 100, which is just the traditional introduction to business course. College-wide, we've got about a 58% success rate. Um, this course is a gatekeeper course. We get a lot of students that this is their very first course that they've taken coming out of high school. A lot of them are not necessarily business majors. So many of them struggle with this idea of learning business terms and technologies. And so we've been able to bring about 73% of the students through successfully in the Introduction to Business course. 
And then lastly is ACC 211, which is um, accounting to a level 11, which is that very first semester foundations, fundamental of accounting. Accounting has been a real challenge for many of us in the OER community. And it's just a matter of the amount of high quality content and um, support that's out there. But even as, as hard as it has been sometimes to make this one work, we've still seen almost a 10% increase in student success in Accounting 211. The important thing to note about that is Accounting 211 is the first class of a two course sequence. And so if they don't make it through 211, they don't go to 212. And so even being able to bring almost 10% of our students successfully through 211, again, supports that completion agenda, keeps that student on track, keeps that student focused, and hopefully will um, continue to build um, you know, additional success as they move through their career. So if you need more information or you're interested in, you know, uh, things that, you know, that we did or um, what worked and what didn't work, um, you can reach me at lswilliams at tcc.edu. And I will be happy to either, um, I'll be happy to either directly, you know, help you, hook you up with a resource that we have. Um, we are today launching a link from our academic services for the Z degree. So we will have a website that we can direct you to that will, will give you more information. So we're always happy to help and really hope that, that this inspires you to do the same thing. So thank you um, for giving me your, your ear for a bit. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Linda, and for sharing uh, those outcome numbers with us. Um, it sounds very promising, and I know that you mentioned that uh, uh, you're likely to expand into different areas as well, so into different degree programs. And yes. um, yeah, thank you. Now I'd like to turn this over to TJ Bliss, who is the Education Officer at the Hewlett Foundation who has been a longtime supporter and proponent of OER and um, is also very interested in the zero textbook cost degree. TJ? Thank you, Anna. Hello, everyone, again. Uh, so I want to start briefly by talking about and, and perhaps reminding some of you of, of just about Hewlett's role in the OER uh, field starting back in 2001 when we made the first grants really in OER uh, to MIT and to Rice and to Creative Commons and the Internet Archive and those sorts of um, entities that really got the, the ball moving forward and has led to where we are today in terms of the OER landscape. Uh, so we uh, as a foundation highly value OER and we see it as a critical uh, component to solving some of the biggest problems uh, in higher education and K-12 and, and international uh, education. And we um, were not involved at all really in, in what Tidewater and NOVA have done around uh, the Z degree idea and uh, the zero textbook cost degree. But when uh, I learned about it, I was so impressed that, that I immediately made it a top priority to figure out how Hewlett and other foundations could help uh, support institutions that are trying to, to do similar things and also incentivize institutions uh, to, to uh, perhaps consider something like a zero textbook cost degree. And so I, I just wanted to speak quickly about why, why we see value in the zero textbook cost degree. Uh, the first is, is what you've seen today is that there's real impact on college access and success for the most dis disadvantaged students. Uh, th that's really important uh, to the Hewlett Foundation because uh, helping decrease equity gap uh, is one of the problems that we see OER can help solve. Uh, another reason that the zero textbook cost degree is appealing to philanthropy, uh, to Hewlett, particularly and to several other foundations that we're working with, 
um, is that it can lead to OER adoption at scale. So Hewlett has invested for a long time in developing, helping institutions and, and organizations develop OER, but we've struggled to get that OER adopted at scale. And the Z degree provides a way to do that in uh, that, that is attractive to faculty and administrators and potentially even policymakers. Um, a third reason I was thinking about as we were talking about this and I was listening to, to Linda and Kim was that um, the Z degree could actually help leverage the materials that are being created out of the Department of Labor's TACT grant program. That's the TAACCCT, which I'm sure Uno can put up some information or a link to that. Um, and, and when I think about this and I think about the impact of, of OER specifically and potentially within the, the context of a degree program, um, I, I'm reminded of, of a, a really a fascinating account of one young man. Uh, this is an African American young man in Kansas who was who was and was working at Taco Bell, and his friend who worked with him decided that he wanted to improve his life, and so he enrolled at a community college in their town, and was successful in completing a degree and, and getting a better paying job. And so this young man. Uh, who was still working to talk about the site, well, I'm going to follow my friend's example. And so he went to um, his college, and that college was actually one of the TACT um, members. And they had de developed a, a course program that is fully openly licensed and, and, and I will be eventually uh, available probably within this year. But, but he took a course on mechanics and schematics. So how to, how to read blueprints and diagrams for uh, whatever, m microwaves, appliances, all sorts of things. And it was kind of a gaming uh, material. So it was a very, very high quality resource. It was uh, um, very advanced, but very, uh, very, very useful. And this student related how uh, after taking this course one day he got a call from his dad. Uh, who lived several, you know, several hundred miles away, and his dad was saying that, you know, that they weren't going to be able to have their family vacation that year because their refrigerator had just broken, and it was going to be very expensive to fix the refrigerator because it required bringing a mechanic out. They were in a rural area, and all of that. And the young man said, "Well, hold on, Dad. I'll I'll come home and take a look at it." And so the young man went, traveled out to his parents' home and dismantled the fridge. <laughs> knew where to get the schematics online. That was something he'd learned in that, uh, that course that he took, was actually where to find schematics and then how to read them, and identified the problem pretty quickly and found that it was a very small minor thing and they were able to fix it and, and then they were able to you know, save that money and, and, and have that family vacation. And the take home message that this student uh, said, he said, I, I don't know, he was still enrolled in the program, he says, I don't know if my degree will get me a job. But at least now I know that whatever happens, I can always start a small appliance repair business. And this this story of of I mean, it's, it's, it has this OER connection because these kinds of materials, when they're in students' hands, can have really powerful uh, powerful effects. And that's that's a reason why Hewlett is very interested in seeing OER adopted at scale. And the Z degree is a, is, a, is an approach for that. Um, the last one, the last reason why we see this as very valuable is, is something that Linda talked about um, in terms of the effect on pedagogy. And Kim hit on this as well, that faculty become more engaged in their content in their course redesign and that it can have real impacts on student learning. So with that said, I, I want to note that there are several other institutions around the country right now that are considering or, or interested in the zero textbook cost degree idea. Uh, I can mention a couple by name because I, I believe that they have publicly noted that they're doing this. Um, the University of Mississippi, the Washington State Community College System, and then several other community colleges in Oregon and Massachusetts and New Hampshire and California have reached out to us or to others that we know that uh, are interested in, in the Z degree. So it's really starting to spread rapidly. And Hewlett, at the same time, is working with other national funders on a philanthropic strategy to support and incentivize uh, the establishment of Z degrees throughout the nation. And this is a work in progress. It's nothing that is, is available now, and there's not grant funding right now available from Hewlett uh, or any other foundation specifically uh, because we're working together to develop a strategy to identify the parameters and criteria for how to, how to distribute limited funds in a most effective way to have the largest impact across uh, 
across the nation. Uh, and to help build awareness about the Z degree program, you know, in a blue sky world, uh, it, it would be desirable from my standpoint that every single community college in the United States and Canada in the next five years has a Z degree program, and that's a goal that I'm I'm kind of pushing hard on. That is a a, a huge lift, even if it's if you imagine just say $150,000 per institution just to pay faculty for their time. That's about what Tidewater spent, I believe. And Linda, you can correct me if that's not uh, the case, but that's my understanding. And so you multiply that out and we're looking at you know, $100 million. But I, I believe that it's something so, um, the idea is so provocative and so uh, fascinating and the evidence of impact is so large that it's not an unreasonable expectation that uh, we may be able to accomplish that together. So in the meantime, if you or your institution is interested in learning more about the Z degree, uh, and, and on, on the technical side, of course, you can contact Linda and, and Kim. But I also want to recommend that you contact the folks at Lumen Learning. These, uh, this is, this, the Lumen Learning folks are um, working on this with multiple institutions right now. They, they helped Tidewater, uh, and I'm, I'm not certain, but I think that they worked with, with you at NOVA, right, Kim? And if not, I apologize if they didn't. But uh, they, they're, they're, they're standing ready. It's their, it's their work to help people actually implement uh, the Z degree and, and open educational resources on, on campuses. And I believe that Kim Thanos is actually on the call. Kim, Kim uh, runs Lumen Learning. And so I don't know, Kim, if you want to put your email address there, they can contact you if they're interested in learning more. Uh, but that's our recommendation that we would give right now. As, as philanthropy kind of figures out and gets our ducks in a row around how to support, um, how to support institutions um, that, are, that are interested in going forward and to incentivize and, and help them do that uh, monetarily as well as with technical expertise and those sorts of things. So uh, I think I'll stop there. And uh, take any questions in the chat box. Thanks, Una. Great, thank you, TJ. Um, also, I know that um, there is a website being built by the Open Education Consortium to support uh, discussions around the Z degree, and I think that's going to be available later this month. Uh, so um, it's available now. I'm typing it in. Oh, wonderful. Okay, um, great. Um, so that's a that's a place for all of us uh, to you know share uh, information and questions about what's happening, and um, as, as this process goes forward. So uh, once again, uh, big thanks to TJ uh, for talking with us today, and uh, Kim and Linda for sharing uh, those really impressive programs that they have piloted over the last several years. Um, at this point, before we go to Q&A, I just want to let you know that we will have a, uh, our April webinar will be focused on publishing tools for OER. So um, join us then if you can. And um, also I wanted to mention that the Open Education Consortium, uh, our global conference is in lovely Alberta, Canada. It's actually in Banff, which is a beautiful area. And it is coming up in April, and we would love to see any of you um, who are available uh, to hear about the global open education movement, not strictly North America, but uh, we will have um, our partners from around the world uh, presenting. All right. Um, so I know there's been a, a lot of great questions um, <laughs> that came in. Uh, going back to just a couple of our early ones, um, we had a question, Kim, for you um, early on um, about um, um, feedback from faculty and students. And I think it was Leah who asked, uh, were there any concerns that faculty and students expressed? Um, yes, I about adoption. Oh, sorry. Um, I, I thought I had touched on it briefly when I went over the quality matters. Um, I've given presentations on um, developing an engaging course um, as focusing on SDV 100 um, in a few different um, venues, and I've also shared our course with 10 BCCS colleges over the last year. Um, and sometimes, you know, you get the question, well, how do you know that it's quality? So I really wanted to put the course design itself through the Quality Matters Review. And again, I served as the subject matter expert so that um, 
the Quality Matters review, the uh, survey feedback from the students, and the instructor feedback when we've offered the trainings and discussion about the course has been just positive all around. Um, so any kind of concerns that anybody had asked about it seem to be addressed just based on taking a look at the course and um, the Quality Matters and the, the student feedback and perspective. And also, you know, the OER initiative in general at NOVA. Okay. Great. So it sounds like you have an ongoing feedback process um, to get feedback from both faculty and students and address that. Oh, sure. Um, as it comes up. Yeah. All right. Wonderful. Um, somebody also mentioned um, that health sciences was an area that they were having some trouble finding OER. and. Um, TJ, and I'll, I'll answer this, but I'll also leave it open to um, if anyone else wants to share about this. Um, as TJ mentioned, the TACT grants, um, many, uh, many of those TACT grants were focused on health care um, and STEM disciplines. And so as those materials become available on the skillscommons.org site, which is the repository for the TACT grants, you'll see more health sciences. Um, health sciences does tend to be a challenging area, so um, I certainly understand that comment. Um, uh, do any of our other presenters want to want to speak to that issue? Um, I, I'll just uh, take a, a stab at it. I think that one of the secrets um, for faculty who may be in something like health science or maybe some of the more um, I don't know, hands-on um, applied disciplines um, is this incredible need to connect with the broader community. Um, in, in other words, reaching out to, you know, the, you know, the consortium, reaching out to, to people like Kim at NOVA or, you know, Richard Sebastian at the BCCS or us at Tidewater to say, what have you all built um, and what can you share with us? Um, Lumen is doing a marvelous job now starting to, to roll out more and more of these complete courses that have been built by some of us who have been working on these initiatives and then, you know, being able to say, oh, okay, well, it's not everything I need, but it's going to get me at least a little way down the road. So don't be discouraged if your first, like, you know, pass through the commons doesn't find you exactly what you're looking for, you know, my advice is use these resources and start asking, hey, what have you built, what do you have, and what can you share? And I think that you'll find that, um, that there may be more out there than you're aware of. Um, but connect. We share. We're open. Yeah, that's that's a wonderful point, uh, Linda. And of course, um, Tidewater and Nova are also members of the Community College Consortium. Um, we are happy to answer questions, and we take um, we also take submissions for uh, for different webinars. So, if there's a specific topic that you'd like to have uh, presented on, let us know, and and we'll gather up some thought leaders like Linda and Kim to come in and and share what they're doing. Um, we had another question, and I, Kim, this might be one to direct to you about, um, it was questions about how do you get uh, faculty across the disciplines um, involved in producing a pathway program? How do you motivate faculty? Uh, so Kim or, or Linda on that one. Um, speaking to SDV in particular, um, I approached, I started small with the online uh, version of the course and approached faculty once the template was designed, um, providing information about what OER is because a lot of people are still learning about it, um, and offering the opportunity to pilot the course and um, you know, then discuss it and share it with the other instructors. And the perception of the course was very positive, so all the instructors for online decided to jump on. And then as NOVA is such a large college, um, the campus hybrid version is spread across five campuses. Um, so we would talk to the faculty across the college at open forums and things like that and trainings to kind of get the word out about OER and what we're doing with SDV and that we're offering a pilot for the hybrid version and more and more faculty would join the pilot each semester so that because we're dealing on such a larger scale, 
that it would get shared across the college and word would get out and just letting it be known that we're going to transition everybody into the fall 2015. And we're also hoping that the student feedback will get out and, you know, talking about OER and be able to take a course without having to buy textbooks, um, that that gets out across the college and encourages more and more faculty and divisions to look at OER and developing them. Great. Thank you for that, Kim. Um, so I'm looking for more questions here. Um, do we have any questions about the uh, philanthropic uh, community and how they're going to support this? Um, I think that there was a question about the $150,000 that we spent at Tidewater. Um, uh, thank you. Yes, Amy asked, uh, thank you for the specifics about cost. At, oh, yes, thank you, Linda. So, was, okay. so at Tidewater, was it $150,000 for the faculty plus an additional fee to Lumen for consulting? Um, that $150,000 um, was split in kind of numerous ways. Part of it, yes, was for Lumen. Um, they provided us the invaluable resource of helping us to curate and um, clear the copyright on our, co on our content. They also helped us physically build our courses out in Blackboard. Um, of course, now we found a better way, but you know, yeah, that was then. Um, the rest of it was um, travel um, for the faculty team to attend things like the um, International Open Ed Conference, um, you know, regional and uh, statewide, uh, you know, meetings and, and places where they could, could find out more and get more engaged. And then we did have fa faculty stipends for this initial group. Um, it was a stipend that was paid above and beyond their, um, you know, normal pay. But you also have to remember that we assembled this faculty team in January in January of 2013 and launched 21 courses in August of 2013. So it was a very aggressive schedule um, and it took up their whole summer. So we felt like um, getting, um, you know, getting, uh, you know, getting them something additional for that. So it really was. Um, it was a hundred, and you're right, it was 150,000 total to take the degree, I mean, from zero to Z. Um, you know, whether an institution could do that for less, um, you know, I think that it's a good benchmark to at least start from. And what we did was we reallocated a existing funds inside of the college that were being underutilized and moved them around for this initiative. And we had the support of the president of our college and our chief academic officer. And it, they made they made it happen. Yes, thank you for that, Linda. Um, and I, I, yeah, that was very inspiring. That that was actually money that you found within your college um, to really address this this need. You know, we're uh, we're running a little over the hour, and I want to give. Um, a hand once again to our presenters. Um, I want to thank all of you who joined us today. Uh, TJ, um, you didn't have any specific questions that I saw in the chat window. Would you like to make a closing comment or two? Yeah, thank you all for joining. I don't have anything else to say, uh, but I look forward to seeing how things evolve in the future. Wonderful. So thank you, TJ, and, and we're so happy that the Hewlett Foundation is um, supportive of this effort and, um, and that so many colleges are, are exploring this and, and moving forward with it. So thank you very much. Uh, we're going to stop the recorder now, and we'll be online for a few more minutes.